Welcome to Happy Children in Safe Seats, Not As Easy As It Sounds. This webinar is sponsored by the Maryland Institute for Emergency Medical Services Systems and brought to you through funding by the Maryland Highway Safety Office. I'm Susanna Guidas jones your moderator, and I coordinate the Child Passenger Safety Healthcare Program at MIMS. Unfortunately, we're not able to offer continuing ed credits for, the, for CPSTs for this particular webinar. Um, check back with some of our future webinars and we should be able to offer those. But you can receive a certificate of participation if you send back a completed evaluation form. This form is available on our website or I can send you one. If you would like to get occasional updates in CPS from us, please complete the contact information page that's attached to the evaluation. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Carolyn Longrell is a child life specialist and child passenger safety technician. From 2001 to 2012, Carolyn worked with families and special needs children at Mount Washington Pediatric Hospital in Baltimore, Maryland. This past year, she went back to school to become a registered nurse. We should all congratulate Carolyn as she just received her hard-earned degree from Johns Hopkins. Carolyn? Thanks very much, Suzanne. Thank you for having me today. So today we're going to be looking at the reciprocal relationship between child development and car seat usage. I know there are a lot of CPSTs listening and I'm sure there are some people who are not techs as well. Um, no matter what your role is, I'm sure nearly all of us have been approached by a parent or a caregiver who is experiencing a car seat challenge related to their child's behavior. So we're going to explore some of the reasoning behind those behaviors and how to use the child's developmental level as a way to solve those challenges. The objectives for today's presentation include, first, to identify the key phases of a child's psychosocial and cognitive development that may create challenges regarding safe travel in the car. Second, you'll be able to identify developmentally appropriate strategies to encourage and enable caregivers to use car seats properly. And third, we're going to explore ways to address the transportation of children with special needs and developmental delays. So what are some of the challenges? Whether you're a car seat technician or a safety advocate, I'm sure you've all experienced a point in your lives, again, as I said, where a parent has approached you with a concern. In infants, a common challenge is excessive crying, sometimes to the point of holding their breath. Toddlers often demonstrate tantrums, that's a developmentally appropriate step for them. And older children, especially those who have peers who don't use booster seats, might put up a fight and refuse to use the seat, and over time that fight can wear on the parent. Then unbuckling is a huge concern, as this may occur while the parent or caregiver is driving, and it presents an immediate safety risk to both the child and the driver. Though this is probably going to sound like common sense, I think it's important to mention. Parents, of course, want their children to be safe and happy. So when they approach you for help, or if you come across something like a seat that's been altered, with tape or, or something to keep the child in it, it's important to recognize the struggles that have ensued to get the parent to that point. Immediately criticizing or immediately offering what you see as the solution is liable to make the parent defensive, and then you're just fighting a bigger battle of us versus them. So first, it's important to acknowledge the parent's concerns, whether you say something like, this must be so difficult for you, I can only imagine how concerning it is to know that you know Johnny could get out of his seat while you're on the highway, let's see if we can come up with a solution together to keep everyone safe. You know, can you tell me what you've tried? In listening to the parent's answer, you'll gain some insight into the cause of the problem and what they've already tried. And again, change takes time, especially for children. So building that positive relationship with the parent right off the bat will increase the likelihood that the parent will stick to whatever solution you come up with together. So what are some of these challenging behaviors and what are ways that parents come up with to try to solve these behaviors? With infants who may cry excessively in their car seats, the parent may think it's related to the child being uncomfortable. So the parent might loosen the harness straps. Or worse, the child might be put in the front seat so that the parent can attend to them more easily. Or even worse, they might not even use a seat at all. Then if the child is able to escape from the seat, the parent might try to alter the seat, maybe by using things like tape or punji cords or aftermarket products. I'm sure 
as technicians, many of us have seen a whole list of things that parents come up with. Or they might compromise with the child and bargain that it's not worth the struggle, we're just going a few miles down the road, he'll be okay if he gets out of his seat. Then vomiting as a result of motion sickness isn't necessarily a behavior, but it is a real challenge, and it's related to a child's development as well. So I'm going to be including it in this presentation towards the end. A lot of parents may reason that transitioning their child to a forward-facing position will solve the issue, but again, as we'll discuss later, that's not necessarily the case. In all of these scenarios, ignoring the problem isn't a solution, because a distracted driver is a danger, and over time, these problems and challenges can develop into something more complex. So when dealing with one of these challenges, challenging situations, the first step involves going back to the basics. So is the seat being used correctly? Is the child's age and size appropriate for that seat? For example, is it fair to expect that a three-year-old is going to sit properly in a booster for the entire car trip? Probably not. Then look at the harness straps if they're in a five-point restraint. Are they rooted correctly and are they snug? You can see in this picture they're definitely not snug at all. And of course, if they're not snug, then the child can easily get out of the seat. It's important to get the parent to show you how they usually buckle the child in. So as we all know, if you're a car seat technician, our definition of snug may differ greatly from that of a non-technician's definition of snug. And sometimes this alone can solve the problem. And then, of course, you want to check to make sure the buckles and buttons are functional and that the installation is correct. Because if the installation isn't correct, you need to start with that first. So starting at the beginning of the lifespan with infant development, the main task for the infant is to bond and attach with their caregiver by building a sense of trust. Then from a cognitive standpoint, the infant is in what we consider the sensory motor stage of development. This essentially means that the infant's knowledge of the world is limited to his or her sensory perceptions and motor activities. Infants utilize skills and abilities they were born with, such as looking, sucking, smelling, grasping, and listening, to learn more about their environment. Then later in infancy, more towards toddlerhood in fact, they develop what we call a sense of object permanence, in that they realize that people or objects continue to exist even when they can't see them. So, for example, even though mom is sitting quietly in the front seat, the toddler knows that mom is still there because that toddler has developed a sense of object permanence. The infant generally has not. Many people know the basic methodology behind soothing infants and calming them if they're crying, but sometimes it helps parents and caregivers if you can provide justification for the behavior and reasons why certain interventions might help. So for example, you could use a blanket with a familiar smell. That can be a comforting reminder to the infant that the parent is still essentially there even if they can't see them. Though it's not always possible, having an adult in the back seat can be very helpful in soothing the infant. Or, when the parent puts the child in the seat, it might help to rock or sway the infant seat before putting it into the car. Infants definitely can calm to movement, but if the parent waits until the car is moving, the child may have reached a point where they're so irritable that they're no longer able to soothe themselves and the whole car trip will be fraught with lots of crying. Sucking on a pacifier can help interrupt the pain pathway in a young infant, so if the seat is slightly uncomfortable for them or if they are in some sort of pain, whether it's you know gastric discomfort, the pacifier can help. Then, for the older infant who maybe is, say, six months old and just starting to, to sit up, it may be time to consider changing to a convertible seat. This allows the child to be in still rear-facing and reclined, but in a little bit more of an upright recline, and it could allow them to see out the window, which can satisfy their emerging sense of exploration. I think it's also important to consider the infant's overall physiological immaturity or their body system immaturity. Specifically, their gastrointestinal tract is still developing. Their sphincters that block the food from traveling back out of the stomach and into their esophagus are often weak and so reflux happens more easily even in healthy infants. Then when you place them in a car seat, although gravity is in your favor, it may actually worsen the reflux because the hips are sort of at a 90 degree angle, which then puts pressure on the stomach, which then puts pressure on that sphincter, 
which then forces the food and acid into the esophagus, which we all know is very uncomfortable, and then of course that can cause irritability. So if an infant is irritable, consider that it possibly could be reflux. It may be a good idea to try traveling in the car an hour after eating to allow more time for digestion. Or maybe the parents have a friend or a cousin or a sister where they can try a different car seat. Different car seats have different internal angles, and so one seat might be more comfortable for an infant than another. So sometimes that's worth a try. Infants are also still developing their ability to thermoregulate or manage their temperature. So they can't sweat as easily. And so the overdressed or overswaddled infant is not only facing a health risk related to being overheated, but they're liable to be irritable from being too hot as well. So definitely take a look at what the child is wearing and being dressed in. Then swaddling or providing boundaries in the car seat with blanket rolls along the sides can be another successful strategy in soothing an irritable infant. Infants, of course, are used to being in that fetal position. Their brain and overall nervous systems are somewhat immature, and they easily can become sensory overloaded. So giving a child a sense of boundaries can help calm those neural pathways. Now, of course, when I'm saying swaddling, I don't mean swaddling the infant and then buckling them into the car seat. I mean buckling them into the car seat and then tucking a blanket tightly around the child um, who's already buckled in. Now we're going to talk about toddler development. For the purposes of this presentation, we're going to call toddlerhood about one to three years of age. Of course, the big developmental milestone for this age is an increasing sense of independence. So when you pair this independence with a restraint, it's no wonder you have challenges. The toddler is also very egocentric in that they can only perceive situations from their own perspective. They don't necessarily grasp the concept that their parent loves them and therefore wants them to be safe and then the car seat helps them be safe. All they know is they don't like sitting in the seat and they want to be doing something else and so they want to get out of the seat. This can lead to tantrums and lots of other defiant behaviors. Separation anxiety peaks around 15 to 18 months of age. So sometimes even being separated from that primary caregiver rear facing in the back seat is enough of a trigger to send that child over the edge. Then of course, toddlers are also perfecting their fine and gross motor skills. So that harness clip or buckle becomes an enticing challenge by which to test those new skills. We touched briefly on what some of the challenges might be in toddlerhood, but unbuckling or escaping from a car seat is probably the, one of the most common ones when dealing with toddlers. In a study conducted in 2011 at Yale University, they found that 51% of families reported that, that at least one of their children had unbuckled their car seats. Of these, 75% were children less than three years or younger and a few of them were as young as 12 months. And then of those unbuckled children, over half were boys, specifically about 59%. So the boy toddler is at significant risk for unbuckling themselves. Then, as I mentioned previously, toddlers exert their desire for independence. So tantrums often ensue, and of course, this can be very distracting for the driver. The child who is able to get their upper torso out of a five-point restraint can suffer serious injury. As you can see in these stills from crash test footage, abdominal or thoracic injury can be very severe, not to mention the head injury from the child moving forward out of the seat and perhaps coming into contact with the vehicle seat in front of them. Talking about interventions for toddlers, so what are some of these interventions we can use with them? First, it's important to convey simple, consistent messages from all caregivers. Whether it's grandma's car or dad's car, the message needs to be clear that the car seat is always used. Even though the child might not fully understand the meaning and the context of, quote, safety, using short phrases like, the car seat keeps you safe, or we can't go to the library if you're not in your car seat, helps to convey the message that this is non-negotiable. When the child is demonstrating good behavior, it's important to reinforce it frequently. 
So for example, for that two-year-old child, if they've stayed in their seat for two minutes down the road, you want to provide that positive reinforcement. Then you might go another two minutes down the road and again provide that positive reinforcement by saying, you know, you're doing such a good job in your seat, you're such a big boy, I'm so proud of you. It's also important to ignore unwanted or, quote, bad behavior. So if the child has a tantrum, it's best to ignore the behavior as long as he or she isn't in immediate danger and remains buckled safely. Once the child doesn't receive attention for this behavior, they're likely to calm down. Even though it's hard, try to use a calm and non-phased voice. The more of a reaction the toddler is able to get out of the parent, the more they are likely to continue to escalate the behavior. If, however, the child does get out of their seat, the parent should pull the car over and either use a timeout or wait until the child is calm enough to put back in their seat. Of course, in the ideal world, we would have time to do that every trip. So if the destination is time sensitive, this can be an issue. So it may be good to advise the parent to allow extra travel time while they're trying to solve this challenge with their child. You want to offer choices when you're able to. So for example, you might ask the toddler, would you like to climb in your seat or would you like me to put you in it? This appeals to their emerging sense of independence. If the child tends to fiddle with the buckles and straps, a good idea can be to keep their hands busy with perhaps Cheerios or window cling stickers that they can put on the window. In the same respect, having a bag of soft toys that are only for use in the car can be appealing for this age then rotating those toys out periodically can maintain their interest. Just make sure they are soft toys because in a crash, we know that hard toys can become projectiles that can injure both the child and other passengers. You can also divert the child's attention out of the car. So have them search for a fire truck or a dog or a ball. Then allowing the child to choose what music they want to listen to could be another strategy. Then if they get out of the seat, the music stops, the car pulls over, and the timeout happens, and that's not much fun. Then as a last resort, in cold weather, of course, you might try a little coat trick. Um, you could have the child wear a light coat or sweater, again, nothing thick or bulky, um, with buttons or a zipper. Then you put the child in the seat and buckle the harness. Then close the coat over the harness. That being said, make sure you can easily undo that coat in an emergency. So sometimes having the buckles out of sight is enough to just keep them out of mind and keep those hands away from fiddling with the buckles. We're going to talk about preschoolers. So preschool, we're talking about ages 3 to 6, but there is definitely a blurring of lines between older toddlers and young preschoolers. Preschool is generally a time when children are truly beginning to assert control and power over their environment by taking initiative and in planning their activities and accomplishing tasks. It's important to encourage these explorations and to help them make appropriate choices because it is through positive feedback and pleasing caregivers that children feel successful and develop self-esteem. In the same respect, preschoolers also interpret things very literally so by saying it's raining cats and dogs literally means that cats and dogs are falling from the sky. So it's important to keep that in mind when speaking with preschoolers. Operating in parallel, of course, is the development of dramatic play and magical thinking. So with magical thinking, a child may believe that if they drink from a red cup at breakfast, it means that they'll get to go to the park later because one time they drank from a red cup and then they went to the park. So this magical thinking can lead toddlers and preschoolers to avoid certain situations or be resistant to new routines. For example, they may not want to drink from the blue cup because it might mean that they don't get to go to the park later, even though that's not a rational relationship. It can be very difficult to break these associations in a child's mind since they're not actually able to think about the situation rationally. Therefore, parents might need to just wait it out or wait until the child forgets the rule they associated between the two. So some things you can do to help solve car seat challenges with preschoolers include writing a story together about going somewhere in the car. This helps to establish an understanding of expectations. So if the child understands what the parent expects from them, they're more likely to comply. 
Dramatic play, as we mentioned earlier, is an important aspect of the preschooler's life. So if, you, if possible, you could bring the seat into the house and let the child strap a doll in and out of the seat and pretend to be the parent. Of course, you want to advise the parent to supervise the child because we also know that car seats can be dangerous um, if the child is not supervised. The child could get tangled in the straps and hurt themselves. So this dramatic play also helps to establish a sense of what behaviors are expected in the car by appealing to the child's interest in fantasy. And again, you can extend that to toddlerhood as well. Children love to feel successful at this age. That's part of their initiative stage of development. So to give them a job or a task in the car so that they can be, receive praise is a great strategy. For example, the parent might say, you know, it's your job to show your little brother how big girls stay buckled up in the car. Then at the end of the trip, you want to reinforce that and say you did such a good job showing your, your little brother how big girls stay buckled up in the car. Sticker charts can be a great visual and concrete reminder of good behavior because, again, preschoolers can't really think abstractly. Then seek and find books, like the one in this picture, can be a great distraction for this age. However, it can make some children car sick, so it may not be a solution for all children. You could also develop a game for long car rides, so developing a bingo game of common items that the child may see along the road, like a truck, with a picture of food on it, or a cow in a field, or find a car like ours, anything that the parent thinks the child would enjoy looking for as they travel along. Also, the parent could map out an itinerary based on landmarks that the child may see. This can be a helpful way for both the preschooler and even school-age child to conceptualize how far they've traveled and how far they have left to go. So you want to remind parents that Again, for any child, change takes time. This is probably not going to be a solution that works after one car trip. So children at this age, approximately 6 to 12 years of age, are developing a sense of cause and effect, and they start to demand more complex answers to their questions. Of course, the development of spelling and language is paramount, and they also begin to develop the ability to think in a more scientific way. So they can think if X happens, what could some of the possible outcomes be? That's generally for the older school age child. These children also begin to develop a sense of morals, and generally they view good versus bad or right versus wrong as what parents or teachers approve or disapprove of. And they also use feedback as a way to judge their competency at something, and their self worth is affected greatly by this. However, sometimes working at times in opposition to this is their increasing need for acceptance by their peers, which we'll see in adolescent development takes an even greater role. So of course, one of the main challenges with this age is continued use of the booster seat. Generally for school-aged children who are typically developing, we're not as concerned with them crying or escaping from the seat. Usually it has to do more with compliance. So these children are beginning to spend more time away from home, and they might travel with friends more often on play dates, etc. And of course, those friends might not ride in boosters. Consequently, they will inevitably question why they have to ride in a booster when their friends don't. If you just respond with, because that's the rule in our car, probably won't suffice and will create a power struggle because, again, children this, at this age have a greater understanding of cause and effect, and they want to know a deeper answer to their question. So it's important to be clear with rules, but also to explain the reason for those rules. One idea is you can sort of run an experiment together and show the child how they don't pass the five-step test in the car. So you can show them how, if they're not buckled into their booster seat, how the seat belt could hurt their neck or stomach if the car had to stop fast. It's probably not a good idea to scare these scare children of this age with horror stories about, you know, trauma injuries. Um, that's not necessarily appropriate for this age. But simple explanations about getting hurt and keeping it simple like that can be appropriate. As with any child, children need to hear when they've done a good job, so be sure to praise them for good behavior. And of course, you want to encourage the expression of their emotion and be em empathetic. So, 
course, the child probably is going to be frustrated if they have to ride in a booster and their friends don't. So by saying, you know, I know you feel mad because you have to ride in a booster, um, you saw how the seat belt doesn't fit you well without one and you could get hurt. So whenever possible, you want to let the child choose their booster, if that's, if, again, if that is a possibility for that family. And certainly for older kids, consider a, a low back booster. Um, if, if that fits the child appropriately because this can be less conspicuous in the carpool line um, and the child may be more likely to, to comply with using it. So on the next slide you'll see a picture of a nine-year-old who really wanted to be out of her booster. So we ran a quote-unquote experiment to see if she could pass the five-step test without the booster. As you can see she didn't the seat belt was cutting into her neck and it rode high on her belly. So once I explained that to her, she was much more accepting of the fact that she still needed to use the booster. By showing her why she needed to use the booster, it made the situation less of a battle between she and her mother. Adolescents, generally speaking, are not in car seats, unless of course they have special needs. Um, however, there are significant car safety concerns related to this age. Adolescents are generally able to think more abstractly and they're able to analyze situations logically in terms of very specific cause and effects and to really start to entertain hypothetical situations. So if this happens, then that. Then this higher level thinking also allows them to think about the future and to evaluate alternatives and set personal goals. Of course, this can also create a challenge in family dynamics as Adolescents may enjoy arguing for the sake of arguing and jumping to conclusions and constantly finding fault in the adult positions. So it can create a real, real struggle in the household. With that, adolescents are becoming increasingly independent from their parents. And the hub around which their world revolves begins to shift from the family to the peer group. In fact, the peer group is so influential that the adolescent may fear the negative social consequences of a choice or their behavior more than the health risks. So for example, they may fear that if they don't drive the car fast that their friends won't like them anymore versus the risks of driving the car fast and getting in an accident and hurting themselves. That being said, however, adolescents begin to shape their identities. So they need room to experiment, to explore, and to take risks and to to experience the results of their own decision making in different situations. Some of the challenges related to being an adolescent are definitely related to the newfound independence of driving. Sadly, motor vehicle collisions cause around 40 percent of adolescent deaths. A majority of these deaths are teens who were not wearing seat belts and studies have shown that young adults aged 16 to 24 have some of the lowest rates of seatbelt use across the entire lifespan. Again, this data I believe is from 2006 in the CDC, so the numbers may have changed over the past few years, but not significantly so. It's the problem is still the same. Continue to change. Yeah, Suzanne, Suzanne definitely said the problem is, is still the same, um, perhaps even more so as we'll talk in a minute about texting while driving. Teens may also, of course, drive under the influence of drugs or alcohol or engage in careless or reckless driving, especially if peer pressure is involved because, again, the role of the peers is very important to the adolescent. Of course, we know that cell phones have become a part of daily life, and as a result, we're faced with a whole new set of problems related to texting while driving, of course, not just with adolescents, but with adults as well. So just recently, um, in June of 2013, in fact, data from a large study was released, um, and it consisted of a sample size of nearly 9,000 teens. And that data showed that over 50% of teens over the age of 16 admitted to texting while driving. So that is a very significant portion of the population. That means, again, about 4,500 teens. Of these students, who reported texted, texting while driving, they also found an increased likelihood that these teens engage in other risky behaviors. Specifically, these teens were less likely to wear a seatbelt and more likely to both drive under the influence of drugs and alcohol 
or drive with someone else under the influence. This is of significant concern because texting while driving can seems to be a predictor or at least an indicator of other risky behavior. So it's important to address that and I think parents perhaps need some guidance to, to directly address that with their teens, especially if the parent engages in that behavior themselves. The interventions that you can use with adolescents. So mainly parents need to make rules and consequences and make those rules and consequences clear to the adolescent and then also follow through on those consequences if the teen breaches that contract. Some studies have actually suggested that a written contract can be an effective strategy for some teens. Again, each parent is going to know what's best for their teen, so it's going to depend on their relationship and that teen's personality. Maintaining as positive a relationship as possible with parents is important. So whenever possible, parents should strive to provide the teen with choices. So it may be something like, you know, you can use the car for three hours to go see a daytime movie, but then you have to come back. But if you want to see a movie at night, I'm happy to take you. That's just an example. You can come up with many different choices that you could offer a teen. And again, the limits that need to be set will be different for each teen. And only the parent is going to know sort of the intensity of what those limits need to be. You can help the parent work through some, some possible rules and, and guidelines and then let the parent sort of choose what they think would be best for their situation because they may need some help coming up with, you know, what are appropriate limits, what are appropriate rules. So parents also need to practice what they preach um, and demonstrate the behavior that they expect from their children. So namely seat belt use, you know, the parent needs to be buckling up on every ride. And very important is that the parent not text while driving. Um, you know, although teens say, often say that you know, they don't like their parents or they have a, you know, a challenging relationship with their parents, they definitely are watching their parents and are, are modeling their behavior whether or not they, they realize it or not. And as with any age, whether you're an infant or you're 100 years old, rewarding good and positive behavior is important too. Everyone likes to feel like they're doing a good job and to receive recognition for that. So for an adolescent, a reward might include you know, increasing independence. Maybe they get to use the car on Saturday or maybe they get to go, you know, they get tickets to go to the movie with a friend or whatever it may be. Um, you know, each family is going to have a different idea as to what's appropriate for, for their teen and their family. We're going to talk about motion sickness briefly. Again, this is not specific to, you know, a specific age or it's not specific to adolescents or specific to toddlers. Um, but a lot of parents may tell you that their child becomes motion sick in the car. And in the case of toddlers, the parent may use this as the reason they want to turn their child forward facing. Um, research shows that motion sickness usually doesn't peak until the school age years, around, again, 6 to 12. Um, and there actually is research to suggest that for children who truly do suffer from motion sickness, um, being rear-facing versus being forward-facing doesn't make a whole lot of difference in sort of negating the effects of being motion sick. That being said, it is a, a real concern and can certainly make car trips very miserable for the whole family. So some suggestions you can offer to help deal with motion sickness include you know, no reading or playing video games while they're in the car. If it's possible, have that child sit in the middle seat of the car in the back so that they can look out the window and see straight ahead. Um, sometimes looking out the side window can be more detrimental than looking out the front window because of the relationship between the brain and the eye and the movement that it perceives. If it's a younger child, you can play I Spy games to encourage them to continue to look outside. Um, sometimes opening the window helps just to get a little fresh air. You could have an ice pack to the back of the neck and of course it's not always conducive to just pack ice packs with you all the time. So it, the parent could get one of those sort of disposable instant ice packs at 
you know, the pharmacy that they could pop open and, and activate in the car if they need to. Um, a cool washcloth can help if they have, you know, a bottle of water that's cool. They can put that on a washcloth and put it on the child's neck. Or saltine crackers or ginger snaps sometimes can help. Um, you want to stay away from greasy um, or heavy foods. And also, an empty stomach can actually make motion sickness worse. So finding that balance between the two is important. Peppermint or ginger aromatherapy, so getting you know essential oils from like the health food store can be helpful. A lot of the studies um, related to this have to do with um, adults and sort of surgical nausea, but the relationship is the same. Um, sort of the, the vomiting pathway is, is very similar whether you're dealing with motion sickness or, or nausea um, related to surgery. Um, similarly, there are these devices called C-bands, which are little bracelets that basically depress an acupressure point on um, the child's wrist. And you can see in that picture sort of where that point is on, on the person's hand, um, or I should say on their arm. Um, again, most of the studies in children are post-surgical, but there is a lot of evidence to suggest this really does help with motion sickness. Um, encouraging the child to breathe, um, take deep breaths can help. And of course, taking frequent stops and getting the child to get out of the car and get moving um, and sort of get some proprioceptive input um, instead of just moving in the car constantly. When at all possible, you want to travel at night um, or during nap time if it's a young child, because if their eyes aren't open, they're less likely to become motion sick. So hopefully that some of those strategies can help a family dealing with that. So now we're going to move into some special needs. Riley's Children's Hospital in Indiana offers an entire course in the safe transportation of children with special health care needs. And the course is offered around the country and was actually just offered in Maryland. Um, it's generally offered once per year here in Maryland. Um, we just had the course again, as I said, this summer, but if you look for emails from Maryland Kids and Safe Seats in the you know upcoming you know, about six months from now or so, hopefully we'll be able to offer another class. So that being said, I'm just going to very briefly skim the surface of this topic. Um, and I, I lumped um, PDD or pervasive developmental disorder, autism, and cognitive delays all together, not because children on the autism spectrum have a cognitive delay or vice versa, but rather because the challenging behaviors that we see in these populations are often similar related to car seats. Again, these are, are generally not conditions that children outgrow. So as the child grows, the options for keeping them safe in the car diminish. So a 90-pound 10-year-old, if they need more than a booster seat, the options become very slim. Also, um, many of these children have difficulty reasoning, so using logical ex explanations for compliance is not likely to be a successful strategy. Often these children have an intense need for routine and sameness. Um, so any change to that can really wreak havoc on their emotional stability. Furthermore, many of these children have difficulty with the processing of sensory information. So touch and feel, um, sounds, sights, smells. So they can be intolerant of certain fabric, um, the smell of a brand new car seat, um, buckles or straps that touch them, you know, the temperature of a, a hot seat that's been sitting in the sun. Um, the sirens of a fire truck going down the road can set some of these children off. Um, you can come up with a whole, whole list of, of things. So I also included this quote at the bottom. It says, be kind for everyone you meet is fighting a hard battle. Because I think it's really important to remember what an enormous challenge families who have children with special needs face. Um, being safe in the car may be what you consider a top priority for the family. But in reality, the family may be struggling with much more basic challenges. For example, something as simple as getting their child dressed in the morning may totally exhaust their reserves. Um, so just keep that in mind when you want to help fix these problems. And again, 
no one knows the child better than the family, so really listen to what the family has to say. So some, some possible interventions that could work. Providing the family with anticipatory guidance can be an enormous help. The family might just be living one day at a time and they haven't really considered what's going to happen when their child outgrows their current seat and needs a new seat, especially if the child is going to need a gradual introduction into the new seat. You know, a lot of families, again, they might think, oh, well, when he outgrows this, you know, five-point harness seat, we'll just get a booster and deal with it then, when in fact that transition might need to occur over a period of a couple months. So if a child is in um, a five-point harness and it's not working for them, it may be necessary to consider something different. And that answer might not always be a bigger five-point harness seat. Um, if the child is opening the buckle of the seat and undoing the retainer clip, you sometimes actually need to think outside the box. So you may find that a seat belt with the retractor locked and the child sitting in a booster that sort of prevents the child from reaching around the booster seat and accessing the seat belt buckle might be a better solution than just a bigger five-point harness seat with a higher weight limit. So it's really helpful to be able to try different seats and try different strategies and solutions. On the third bullet point, you'll see the website for the Automotive Safety Program at Riley Children's Hospital in Indiana, as I mentioned earlier. So if you're dealing with a child with special needs, I would really encourage you to contact them um, or go on the Safe Kids website where you can search for a tech in the area who has received this special training from Riley's it can be very helpful because there are many things to consider about the installation, vehicle requirements, seating location in the car, etc. So on the next slide you'll see a picture of an easy on vest. I'm just going to give you a couple examples of what you might use in a last resort type of, of situation when you've exhausted all the conventional options. So this easy on vest um, is the vest is on the left and then the floor mounted tether is on the right and again that's kind of a school bus seat but it was the best picture I could could find. The vest essentially zips up the back and prevents the child from getting out of the vest and then the floor mounted tether sort of keeps that the harness attached to the child and then attached to the car. The problem is that um, this the tether system requires professional installation of a heavy-duty tether anchor in the vehicle and generally speaking the floor of the vehicle needs to be accessible through the bite of the seat um, and then because you're modifying the vehicle it only means that that one car can transport the child unless you modify multiple vehicles so it can be a wonderful solution but it's not necessarily the go-to easy you know first solution that that you should use On the next slide, you'll see a picture of the Roosevelt seat by Merit Manufacturing. And I included their website on the bottom of the slide. So this is a very heavy, large, it's called a medical seat. Um, it does have a cover to prevent the child from undoing the harness retainer clip. And it also has a buckle guard that you can order with the seat. So it's important to note that those two devices the, you know, the harness cover and that the buckle retainer clip are only approved for use with this seat. So you can't get those and put them on the, you know, Graco My Ride 65. And unfortunately, this seat is not necessarily compatible in all vehicles, and it costs upwards of $1,000, and, you know, insurance doesn't necessarily cover it, and it's heavy. So again, it's, it's not um, necessarily the easiest go-to solution for a child with special needs if you can come up with something conventional. And again, if you're thinking that the child may need a specialized restraint, it's really important to get a special needs trained technician involved. Um, and often these children are receiving occupational therapy and physical therapy services, so it's really important to get those therapists involved too. So if you haven't gotten special needs trained, you know, certified yet, um, it may be something you want to look into or just to at least know when it's, it's important to refer out to one of those special needs technicians. That about wraps up this presentation. You know, thank you all for listening today. I think we have time for a few questions, if anyone has any. Well, thank you, Carolyn. That, that was wonderful. I wish I had some of those tips when my kids were little, although your comments about um, 
Adolescents were helpful for me <laughs> now. In fact, that made me think of one question that is right where my kids are at. Um, is it a good strategy as a parent to tell your adolescent to tell their friends in kind of a peer pressure situation that, well, I can't do that. Like, I can't ride without my seatbelt buckled or I can't talk on the cell phone while I'm driving because my mom will kill me. Is that a good strategy or is that a bad idea? I think it depends on the child um, and depends on their relationship with their friends. Um, I think if the teen sort of blames it on the parent, um, you know, the friends may be like, oh, well, yeah, her, you know, her mom just, her mom's a pain and, you know, we don't, we don't want to listen to her. You're fine. You can text. We won't tell your mom. So, you know, if the teen is confident enough to say, you know, my mom doesn't allow that and it's because, you know, I've heard that, you know, you can get really injured and I don't want to get injured. Or if, it, if the teen is confident enough to sort of, sort of own that responsibility, then I would sort of recommend that. But if they have to blame it on mom and they're okay with blaming it on mom um, and they're okay with their friends then sort of blaming that mom, then that sort of, you know, can, it's probably perhaps the road they have to go down. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely a challenge and it is different for every, for every child um, and every, you know, relationship that they have with yes. their friends. Yes, every kid is different. Anybody have any questions for Carolyn? You can unmute yes, your phone. Go ahead. I have a question. Um, in slide seven, you were saying to soothe an infant, you could rock, sway the seat um, before you put the child in. Wouldn't that make the seat loose or? That, that's a good question. I probably was not very clear on that. So let's say you're in the house and you buckle them into their infant carrier, um, like the one in that picture. Um, so you buckle them in and you sort of, you know, rock the seat on the floor or you carry it and sort of move okay. them. And then when you buckle them in the car, you know, you, you're, you shouldn't rock or sway it anymore. Um, but when the seat is free from the base um, to rock okay, or sway it. Okay. Yeah, no, that's a thank you for clarifying that. And I have one more sure. um, question. Sorry. Sure, that's okay. Oh, not a question. I guess it was a, a suggestion. Um, when you were saying that it's hard to get preschoolers to sit in, I guess, the car seat because, or not preschoolers, I guess, um, older kids because they think it's not cool, whatever. Mm -hmm. I know I was taught when I went through uh, safety school that if you tell them that they can look out the window or show them how they can look out the window easier mm -hmm. when they're in a higher seat, it makes them feel more comfortable in a booster. Yeah, that would just be, be another suggestion. Yeah, that's great advice. And uh, yeah, again, you bring up a good point. It's it's very helpful to talk to other technicians and other, you know, colleagues as to what they've experienced. Because um, I think as if we all sort of work together, we can come up with a, a really great sort of list of, of solutions and ideas. So, you know, I often will talk to other technicians and say, hey, I'm, I'm struggling with this. What what should I recommend for this family? Other questions? I have a comment. This is Kim Allman from the Study Center. The one thing I have a six-year-old, and the one thing that he has always grown up knowing from us and has helped keep him in his seat is that I have two, two of my most important jobs in this world are number one is to love him, and number two is to keep him safe. And by keeping him safe, that means he has to ride in his car seat. And he has been good with that. And also, I let him know that it's the law, and the law says he has to be there. And if he doesn't, then he's going to, you know, get hurt. And then we're also going to get a ticket. And if I get a ticket because you're not in your seat, then you're paying it. <laughs> and for him, that has worked because he's into money and stuff like that. And he <laughs> knows that if he has to give up some of his money, you know, I know he wouldn't, but, you know, it, it helped us, but the love and protect seem to be the two that really hit home for him. Yeah, that, that's great, and I think, you know, the sooner you can start with that, with children, the better, you know, I don't know what age you sort of, sort of started communicating that message very clearly, and I'm sure all parents do, um, but relating to the car seat, you know, the sooner you, you talk about it with that toddler, the, the clearer the message becomes over time. I like that uh, message about the money for yes. uh, preteens. <laughs> I think that would be very effective for them. 
Any other questions? Um, I have one more question about the having a book while they're reading in a car seat. Isn't that sort of like having a hard toy while they're in the car seat? It can be. Um, so you want to like take a look at that book because again, they can. Okay. It could be a projectile. Um, you know, you you could take some of the pages and sort of laminate them um, so that okay. they're essentially softer. Um, but yeah, the the one that picture of that little boy who was looking at the book. I think they were right, yeah. parked in the you know grocery store parking lot. So um, sometimes even you know if the child can't use the book while they're driving, um, mm -hmm. if they know that like, okay, well, when we get to the carpool line and we have to wait for my, you know, big brother to get into the car, I can look at the book right. then. All right, well, thank you so much for tuning into today's webinar. If you would, please take a minute and complete the evaluation form that's on our website, or I can email it to you and then send it or email it or fax it back to me in order to get a certificate of participation. Um, attached to that is a contact sheet. If you would like to get follow-up information about other webinars or materials that we have available, I'd be glad to send you those. Um, again, thank you so much, Carolyn, for speaking with us today. I think it's been a really useful webinar. And have a nice, safe summer and stay cool.